So, okay, so uh, might pass. Um, um, so there's, uh, just go through the life cycle a little bit. So uh, it, it's really to illustrate how quickly the uh, spikes can, mites can build up uh, in, in a short period of time. Um, we're, uh, we have uh, growers that are trying to keep their relative humidity as low as possible. And, um, and uh, that's lending itself to speeding up the uh, process for the, for the spider mites. Um, those of you, of you that uh, don't know, I'm going to kind of simplify things in the spider mite. If you look at the lower picture, um, the uh, you know known known as the two spots. The two spots are actually chlorophyll on the plant, and they're sucking it up into their body. And the predatory mites, when they feed on them, are actually feeding on that. So um, they can uh, they can do a lot of damage in a short period of time as far as uh, disrupting photosynthesis on the plant and um, and the, the uh, stippling. Go ahead. As I said, it enjoys hot and dry conditions, uh, which isn't conducive to some uh, predatory mites. Um, so it gets the jump on them. So it reproduces very quickly, as I said. Uh, Usually starts on the underside of the leaves, um, not always, but that's a, a good place to, uh, to start uh, with your scouting. Uh, pulling uh, leaves, turning leaves upside down and having a look. Sometimes you can see a little start of, um, I used to have a picture uh, here, that just showed the start of stippling. And, uh, and it was a good one because it, it, sometimes you don't need very much to see. I always just assume on uh, spider mite hosts um, that they're there at that time of year. So I, I'm always looking for them. Um, that also moves to the tops of the plant and uh, it starts producing the webs as they go. Uh, the top picture is a little far, uh, you know, from uh, similar to the picture you had, Sarah, but it being a little far gone. Uh, these webs will. Uh, will protect them from uh, predators and sprays, contact sprays. So, uh, so it does them to good. But I mean, the real reason they do that is uh, just like spiders uh, outdoors, uh, they're doing the web so they'd be carried away in the wind. Uh, we see, you know, again, once it gets into this stage where there is um, uh, webbing is usually in uh, greenhouse vegetables more than ornamentals. We don't let really it get that far, but in uh, greenhouse vegetables where there's uh, even strings of uh, spider mites coming down uh, on a single web, uh, any breeze or people walking by will transport it down the row. So it's important to get it before it gets to that stage. Um, over time, we've discovered in Ontario uh, two types of spider mites. They're exactly the same uh, DNA-wise, but uh, one is our, our resident population that we always have, and the other is foreign arrivals that could soon become resident population, but uh, they have different traits uh, involved with them. You see the stippling on the, on the top picture of the roses. Um, the, um, yeah, so, so it's important to know where the spider mite are coming from. Um, you uh, go to the next slide. So we'll start with the resident population. So um, these can easily overwinter in the greenhouse structure and benches. When I was in college studying all this stuff, um, you know, you know, the textbooks all said, oh yeah, we're going to diapause in the winter, turn turn red, uh, nothing seeds on them, uh, can't get them with sprays. Um, I, that's no longer the case. I, I, I rarely see that unless there's a problem with um, uh, heat in the in the in the winter. If, if it does, uh, maybe I've seen it in Ulster area, which is pretty cold. Uh, cut flower crop in December, you can almost see the, your breath in there. 
but it really only lasts as long as there's a little bit of chillier weather. Um, so they're always active. Uh, they may, you know, slow down their life cycle, obviously, in the winter months, but uh, they're still there. Um, uh, the the resident spider mites can still be controlled with the very minimal mitocytes that we have. You know, those of you in the States, uh, you have a lot more available to you uh, to rotate. Uh, one of our problems in Canada is getting, you know, the odd chemical uh, registered that everybody has to use because the rest have uh, resistance properties to them. And so it, it'd be much better if you got two mitocytes at the same time. Um, or more the better. So uh, uh, the biome control is very effective uh, to release early. I'll go into the biome control in the, in the following slides. Um, uh, the, uh, if you know uh, where things have built up the previous season, uh, as things kind of move to the structure and that sort of thing, and then you put a new crop in, um, you can start your uh, low release fasciae uh, in that area, and, uh, and chances are it'll show up uh, in that area. Uh, what we try to do is get everything cleaned up before August, which is no mean feat, and that's Hard to do, uh, but we try and do uh, do uh, that. And one of the things uh, I've noticed is uh, when uh, there's a huge uh, growth of weeds and grass along the outside perimeter of the greenhouses, we try and get the grower on it early so it can be uh, weed eaten uh, down, uh, kept really short uh, for the summer months. One of the things that happens is they don't have time, so they, they end up doing something like a roundup around the outside of the greenhouse. And what roundup does is, uh, yes, it does kill weeds, but it takes a little bit of time doing that. So as the plant is dying down, the spider mite takes off. And the nearest thing is the structure on the outside of the greenhouse. And we'll actually see it um, around August, late August, uh, on the inside. Of the uh, of the wall of the greenhouse, so it's very important to uh, get ahead of that before it happens, and it really cuts down on the need to do um, protective uh, uh, control measures uh, in the greenhouse afterwards. Um, I prefer that they weed eat; uh, they don't, the growers. But uh, it's, uh, it's it's a you know a quicker thing. It's not like it's going to kill uh, any spider mites that are there, but it's it's uh, knocking down everything uh, uh, early and then uh, and keeping on it. Um, yeah, and so so uh, if things go to the wall, wall inner wall uh, late in the season, uh, you can expect them to come out of there in the spring. Okay. Um, as I said, they can overwinter in the greenhouse uh, structure. Uh, and benches, uh, seen them in uh, anything uh, metal as well. We used to think that they, you know, preferred uh, the old style hoop houses where they had a lot of wood and that sort of thing. Um, I see them in uh, poles um, that are holding up netting for cut flowers um, uh, in the corners of the newer uh, uh, sub irrigation movable benches. Uh, they should be cleaned and probably a little bit of bleach in there. Um, uh, uh, and those others I already said. So uh, next up. <clears throat> so uh, the other the other uh, two spot of spider mate, which is the same DNA again, is our the ones we're getting in on things like cuttings and uh, uh, larger plants. Uh, we've had a real run on uh, growers uh, really brokering uh, larger plants such as uh, hibiscus, uh, mandevilla, um, where they're all coming from, say, the southern states, that sort of thing. Um, and they're coming in with uh, spider mite on them. Other things as well, such as white fly, sometimes Venetia. Uh, and they're only really in there for a short time when they're brokering them. 
uh, but it's long enough to spread anything they have into the crop. And it took me a while to kind of figure that out that that's what's happening because I, you know, if we use the miticide in the nearby uh, growing area, why was it no longer working, right? And uh, it was working in other places in the greenhouse. So I looked at uh, what was actually coming in and how hard we're having uh, uh, control, control, controlling the, uh, the foreign arrivals. Uh, they can turn into a resident, uh, as I said, very easily. So, um, uh, so if they're left, they'll go to the structure and the benches and that sort of thing. Um, we, we have all kinds of resistance problems with that. Um, goes back to that, that slide of grams that uh, you know, the poinsettia uh, cuttings uh, with all the pesticide residue on them. Uh, the same probably we could, you know, if you did the same with those hibiscus uh, leaves, uh, that's a possibility too. So you're not only getting the pests um, on the plants, but you're also getting them sprayed with, with everything. And uh, so you're shooting yourself in the foot as far as uh, uh, control, uh, adequate control uh, with them. Um, the the other thing is when you're when you're thinking about the cuttings that are coming in, um, we recommend a dip, um, which Sarah went over earlier. Um, it it's still unclear. I mean, we're still getting some uh, spider mites coming through. Uh, you know, and, and you know, we're kind of testing in the field um, some of the oils now um, that uh, may work at just really smothering uh, them. They're usually coming in on the egg stage, uh, so it's really smothering the egg before it hatches. It's definitely helping. Um, it's, you know, total control is, is another thing. Um, so what you can do is uh, after that, uh, there is some there is some research. Uh, being done and whether it's uh, uh, some of those uh, dips are actually uh, washing the spray residue off and how well it's doing that. Um, but also when the plant is stuck and it starts to grow in, in new growth, not doesn't necessarily have the spray residue on it. So you can go with biocontrol after that. But it, it all comes down to knowing which one you have. Um, you know, I jumped ahead a bit, uh, so suppression can be achieved with the dipping and cuttings, as I said, and uh, add the biocontrol afterwards, a uh, picture of someone dipping in the top there. Um, pretty much uh, all of our client base are, if they're not dipping, um, they're, they're considering it uh, on, on the plant material that they can't. So some are considered a little bit too fragile. Uh, some don't come in cuttings, although some people are dipping now with uh, uh, plug trays uh, turned upside down, which is, I didn't think I'd see that, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's worked in some cases. So I've had uh, one grower uh, had done it. Um, when one of the new oils came out, they, they turned one of those full-grown hibiscus plants and uh, and dip the entire plant in uh, in oil. Uh, I was there to kind of I was there afterwards to try and you know look and see what kind of phytotoxicity on the hibiscus was. Of course, they're known for dropping their leaves if they don't feel right. So um, it, it turned out it was okay, but uh, I wouldn't suggest that. Um, but some people are doing it, so. So biocontrol spider mites, uh, these are kind of our main ones that we're using in our program. Phytosulius uh, uh, persimilis, uh, Californicus, Delphiella, and Stethrus postulis. And I'll go through each one of these. Thanks. So the number one kind of our workhorse um, when we have uh, spider mite is uh, persimilis. Uh, one of our oldest BCAs. Um, you need uh, a lot of people still don't know this. Uh, I see, I 
see uh, people releasing uh, for stimulus when there isn't uh, spider mite present, but you need it to uh, have spider mite there to survive. Uh, it doesn't, uh, I, I think I keep need to repeating that, to repeat that. So um, they, they, are, uh, they are needed. Um, I, I find uh, you need to do it quite heavily when, you're, when you have spider mites just to be sure uh, what level it is. So I would use the curative rate that the biocontrol companies uh, suggest. Uh, they attack all stages of spider mite, which is convenient, and uh, they, you know, the one advantage of the spider mites getting out of control is, is growers are trying to keep their RH uh, at a minimum uh, for other reasons, for disease reasons, and so on. Uh, for some of us, that was uh, better at, uh, uh, at RH. Uh, many years ago, I worked with uh, NATO, uh, NATO adapted strain of um, a similar so Dave Rayworth and uh, Dave Gillespie worked on, uh, and um, you know the the big reason that came out was uh, Persimilis was only really going to the the um, second from the top um, stratus in, in tomato plants where they really needed to be on top where the spider mites were kind of walking along the top, and the reason that was. Is within the plant structure of a big, huge tomato plant, the RH is more, uh, uh, they're, they're adapted more to that RH than they at the top where the sun's hitting it and so on, so it's drying out. Um, since California went to a slow release sachet, I see it everywhere. It's, it's uh, been a real game changer because you put it in the crop when the Plants are very young, uh, and now of course they have um, uh, popsicle sticks or whatever they can put on, they attach to it so they can stick right into potted uh, plants uh, without even the plant being there. Um, we um, uh, we've used a real star for us has been Phalaenopsis scolastis, and uh, they can live. Uh, in the crops for a long time without any spider mites. So having them in there ahead of time uh, before any spider mite uh, shows up is a real, uh, like I said, a game changer. Um, place plus, of course, it will not come in a slow release sachet, but um, we use it uh, as uh, in conjunction with persimilis most of the time. My growers use it, I should say. <clears throat> um, um, comes in a good, yeah, this good. Uh, so Celtiella, um, this is this is something you'll find outside. I have this uh, <clears throat> habit of looking on the on the fence rows in the summertime. Um, we we have a fair amount of um, uh, wild grapes and uh, wild roses around the around the area in southern Ontario, uh, and I'm going flipping leaves on there to see how the spotting might. Uh, populations are doing. Um, I'll find Celtiella larva everywhere. It's uh, it's 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 really has no problem finding spider mite outside. Um, we find inside in, in spore culture, uh, it works better uh, when you have other predators going as well. So um, it's again uh, relying on the on the next generation to do the control, and you saw how quickly spider mites can build up in a short period of time. So uh, it, by the time it kind of goes through its life cycle, if you just release it, um, you know, your spider mite can get pretty high. Um, we do have trouble getting it established in greenhouses. Um, again, but it does come in during the summer. So we, we use the natural one. Um, the uh, larval stage is on the, on the lower right. Uh, that's what does the killing. Uh, it, it's quite proficient in, in killing spider mite. can do a lot in a short period of time. The uh, pupil case, which is always in the same spot on the leaf, along with that, this would be the petiole where, the, you know, where it attaches to the stem. 
uh, and that uh, that actually one where the arrow is pointed to is already hatched. So uh, that comes again out into uh, an adult. <clears throat> um, again, it you know works probably better in greenhouse vegetables where you can tolerate some uh, pest pressure to still harvest the crop. It takes about two two to four weeks. It's a long time for floriculture, so um, I, I'd like it to work better, um, but uh, but difficult. Uh, I brought up. Um, uh, still with me? Sarah, can you hear me? Okay. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, I probably went deep on my phone, so I was just wondering. Uh, you can go back one, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Self, yeah, All right, great. Okay, so there's a, a species of lady beetle. Uh, it's kind of one of our native ones uh, in Ontario and other places too, but uh, it, was, it was developed down in uh, London, Ontario for commercial use. Uh, you know, applied bionomics applies it quite a bit, and I think others do now too. Um, we see it, um, it, it, it shows up, uh, when it shows up, it shows up in huge numbers, um, usually outdoors, uh, at nursery crop growers. Um, when we do start seeing uh, lady, um, butter, butter mites uh, going into the summer, just even those early colonies, uh, this shows up, um, it starts reproducing. Um, let me know if you can't hear me again, uh, Sarah. Um, uh, uh, so um, I have seen it in the greenhouses. Uh, I saw a really good cleanup uh, one year in uh, uh, greenhouse Ulster area. Uh, but again, the plant's always around kind of thing and, and uh, puts up shoots. So um, again, it would probably work better with other uh, faster uh, predatory mites. Um, the adult and the larval fetal spider mites. Uh, the adult is a very strong flyer. Uh, we see it mostly if, if anyone's local here, uh, uh, kind of vineland hitting uh, east uh, in, in the Niagara Peninsula. So Elizabeth is probably down there somewhere uh, in, in New York. Uh, so you would see it out, outdoors if you had an outdoor crop of spider mites. And be it's funny because I don't see it on the West Niagara, <laughs> so I don't know whether you know it's possible it could be uh, orchard sprays or something, but it's uh, it's very localized down there. Um, yeah, it likes uh, low uh, RH and high temperature. But, uh, broad mites uh, becoming more and more of a problem. Um, <clears throat> This is something that comes in on the plant material, so it's really an offshore problem for us. Um, it doesn't overwinter in our greenhouses, uh, so we'll see it. It comes, it shows its ugly head around uh, now, uh, about mid-February. We start seeing it on uh, shipments that came in much earlier. Uh, but you know, I can go to you know a dozen greenhouses. In that first week I see it and, and go to uh, certain varieties and so on of, uh, let's say, begonia or calancho and uh, see it uh, see it everywhere. So it, it rises rises up all at the same time. Um, uh, it can drop from hanging baskets. So if you're hanging stuff like uh, New Guinea and Patience, um, begonia, uh, Rieger begonia. Uh, it can drop uh, if the puppies get high enough, um, and it, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, they carry their mate around, and and when they're on the move like that, uh, that's a very good time to get it with a spray. Um, we have been using Avid. Um, obviously, we can't use it everywhere, but um, especially with the hanging baskets, Avid. Uh, through an LVM has, has worked um, quite well. Um, so, uh, or, or calling it out. So, I was just in a greenhouse last week and I saw one plant with it. And uh, so, I, I recommended a spray, but um, 
I was able to take that one plant out. I mean, it's easily you see the damage first. So, um, yep. Uh, just some of the uh, pictures of damage, toppling scribber, obviously, and uh, and it has this uh, uh, distortion uh, look to it. Uh, these are fairly far along, so you know it's always best to take a picture of something fairly far along. But you got to get it before this stage. So um, one of the things that shows up as far as damage goes is um, if you have a sense uh, that the leaf color is a little bit off, uh, it almost you know it's a bit of a bronzing, and uh, flip the leaf over and you'll see a bit of a scarring. scarring um, they they destroy the plant tissue in a line and lay their eggs in that and then the plant scars up over top of it and protects the egg. So if you see that scarring, uh, that is nothing really else does that except um, uh, you know if you damage the plant on your own kind of thing. But if you see that on a number of different uh, leaves on the same plant, you probably have broad mites. Um, uh, cyclamen uh, will get also cyclamen mite while the control measures are both the same, so I kind of uh, lump cyclamen mite and broad mite into the into it. Same family, same uh, control measures. Yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, I think that was a quick one. We're at two o'clock. And. There's yeah. going to do white. There's going to do white fly. Uh, sure. And then we'll uh, maybe we'll do a break for questions. Um, yeah. And then we'll do just dis disruptors, and then maybe more questions at the end. Does that sound good? Sure. Some some questions. Uh, you want to do questions now? There's some questions. Yeah, we can do some questions now. Actually, what I would love to do, if everyone um, wouldn't mind, is I meant to launch a poll at the beginning um, to <laughs> see where everyone's from and what crop you grow and get information on your level. So I think we'll run that now um, just to get some information about you guys. So um, you'll see it pop up on your screen. You've got a few seconds to answer. And then uh, I think there's four or five questions. Yeah, four questions. And then it should all, um, then I'll end it in a few minutes. Only one person's answer, come on guys. <laughs> this helps us plan for next year and target the right people. If, uh, do you want me to answer a question while we're doing this? Yeah, sure. Okay, some growers are use sulfur to manage mites. Is there any efficacy data? Uh, what is the compatibility of sulfur when using a PCA program? Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell the difference between Celtiella and Acelia? There's a lot of questions here. Can you tell the Okay, well, we'll do this first one first. Uh, so sulfur uh, can be harmful to the BCA. Um, usually uh, parasitoids. Uh, I think it was Copert that did a uh, study uh, years ago where they found that if you did it every day, you're okay as long as you stayed. Uh, these are for sulfur pots, so I, I'm not speaking about uh, spraying sulfur on. I have no experience in that, and I actually wouldn't recommend it anyway. Uh, but the, uh, these are the sulfur pots, uh, and normally they're used here for uh, powdery mildew control. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if you do it every day, you're okay as long as you stay within about two to three hours a night. If you go over that, you can skip a day. And then, so if you did it five hours a night, for instance, you can skip a day and, uh, and, do, it, and do it the following day. Uh, and it has less effect on uh, BCA. Uh, can you tell the difference between Feltiella and Acetylese maggot? Okay. So you want to you want to say something, Sarah? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I so Acetylese are bright orange, 
Uh, I think that's the biggest difference. And then the felt yellow are just like a boring, beigey <laughs> colored. So that's the biggest difference. The Italy is really, you can't miss them. They're the or only bright orange thing going on. Yeah, felt yellow larvae would not be anywhere but in spider mite as well. So you're not going to see them uh, in aphids and things like that. So, uh, so look and see what they're eating. For one thing, but they are very different in how they look. And there's following, and the last question that she's asking is are onion shrimp found throughout the US as well? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, part of the issue might be I mean, they've always been a pest outside, and I think they've um, become more of a pest inside, specifically because we've um, uh, gone away from more pest. Uh, pesticide applications to true biocontrol and there's less pesticide applications that could be affecting them. So they're almost like a secondary pest that's that sort of moved in. Um, yeah, I just want to echo uh, Mike's comments about the sulfur. Yeah, we burning sulfur pots is legal in Canada. I know it's not in the US. And sort of like I've heard the rule of thumb is um, 12 hours max a week. So with a maximum of four hours of burn a night. So you can burn three nights for four hours as long as you don't exceed 12 hours. So I'm sure you'll hear different stories from different people, but that's sort of the general one that I've been recommending to people. And there's lots of people who do sulfur for powdery mildew and still have really, really good biocontrol programs. So I don't think that's an issue, but yeah, I don't know about their efficacy on mites. That, that could be updated too. It's been a long time since I kind of looked at that. And we have uh, more, BCA, more BCAs available now than, than the last time I looked at that. So I think it's, you, you're probably correct on, on your number. Well, yeah, and it, and it also really depends on your, um, uh, like the number of sulfur burners that you've got in your greenhouse too, right? So obviously like if you've got hordes of them, that <laughs> 12 hour rule might not work. So um, it's always good to keep an eye on your bios and make sure everybody's still alive. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll get to more questions at, at the end.